Ever hear of the word sorites? You say, a what? Sorites. You say, that sounds like an eye that is sore because it's been teased. Uh, what's up with sorites? Well, that's not the idea at all. A sorites, in traditional logic, is a chain of successive syllogisms or units of argument that uh, follow after two premises to a conclusion. I know that sounds complicated, so let me share with you a, a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. All bloodhounds are dogs. All dogs are mammals. No fish are mammals. Therefore, all bloodhounds are not fish. That would be an example of what we're discussing right now. Uh, here would be another example. Some enthusiastic people show poor judgment. All people who show poor judgment uh, frequently make mistakes. No one who makes frequent mistakes deserves implicit trust. Therefore, some enthusiastic people do not deserve implicit trust. Did you know that the Bible, from time to time, it will bring to our attention a sorites? It's true. The Apostle Paul makes use of a sorites when he wants to show the interconnected consequences that follow from denying the resurrection of Jesus. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 14, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there be no resurrection from the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our teaching vain? And if our preaching is vain, your faith is also vain. Now at the start of 1 John chapter 5, we come across a sorites. We discover a chain of units of argument that follow two premises that lead to a conclusion. The sorites uh, points to two logical relationships. Now, by logical relationships, I'm not referring to some geometry theorems. Uh, Pastor Marvin made reference to trigonometry, which I think I barely passed in junior high school. But um, we're not talking about geometric theorems. By logical relationships, we're also not uh, talking about uh, something that you can uh, learn in a philosophy class. I'm talking about the logical relationship between two facts. If fact number one is true, then fact number two must also be true. There is an automatic connection between those two things. Now, we discover logical relationships at the very beginning of 1 John chapter 5. Go ahead and turn in your Bible to that section of Scripture, if you will. 1 John chapter 5. That chapter deals with our relationship that we have with God, with other Christians, and also with God's Word. And the first logical relationship that John is bringing to our attention is between our faith in Jesus and our spiritual birth from God. The second logical relationship that John tells us about uh, deals with our love for the Father and our love for Christians. And the third logical relationship that John brings to our attention has to do with our love for God and our love for uh, God's Word and, and obeying the commands. Now, as I read 1 John chapter 5, I'd like for you to see if you are able to notice these logical relationships that all come together. 1 John chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. 
Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, in these verses, John sums up his message with a sorites. And this is what John is getting across. To believe in the messiahship of Jesus uh, indicates that there is spiritual birth from God. And to receive spiritual birth from God involves loving God. And to love God, that involves loving God's people. And so the conclusion of this Sorites is this. To believe in the Messiahship of Jesus ultimately leads to loving God's children. Now in this passage, John is, is not talking about uh, how you can know if other people know the Lord. That's not his, his point here. He's discussing how true faith in Jesus always expresses itself. And as we experience our love for other people, as we experience love for God, which is evidenced by our love for God's word, then we give evidence to the fact that we are truly born again. Now, I'd like for us uh, to go ahead and check out, very simply this morning, three logical relationships. I know that there are some passages in the scriptures that are, are kind of fun, they're very visual, they are full of illustrations. Uh, this is something that requires us to put our thinking caps on and, and to really think through it, uh, otherwise we're not going to get the point that John is getting across. And so, uh, even though this may seem rather heady, or intellectual, uh, we need to, to track with John's argument. And I know that you're an intelligent group of people. I can, I, I can tell it just by talking with you. I know that you'll be able to, to grasp everything that we're discussing here today. So let's look at that first logical relationship, and that involves the fact that our faith in Jesus um, gives evidence to spiritual birth. Uh, most people in the world really don't know what a true Christian is. I'm convinced of that. There are people who think that a person is a Christian simply because a person says, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm one of those. Or we assume a person is a Christian simply because that individual is wearing a cross around his or her neck. Or maybe that person is involved in... in observing on social media certain Christian programming that is taking place or that uh, man or woman is involved in, in sharing acts of kindness, doing good things, and, and even financially contributing uh, to, to good causes. And we say, that's what a Christian is. Well, that's not what a Christian is. Now, a Christian may do those things, or any one of them, but that's not what identifies a true Christian. God's word says a Christian is an individual who is born again. In fact, it's interesting to me every so often I will hear someone make reference to a born-again Christian. That's, that's really a redundancy. It's, it's been overly repetitive. That's like uh, me referring to uh, a man as being a male man. Well, if he's a man, he's a male. Now, there's confusion among what a gender is these days, but I think for most of us, we know what a man is. And it's a person, obviously, who at the minimum is a male. So a born-again Christian is redundant. But a person who is a true Christian, not just one in name, but truly a believer in Jesus is a person who is born again. This is a person who has faith, trust, dependence, 
in the person and in the finished work of Christ to the extent where this person at one time was maybe disobedient to God and now is a child of God. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, James chapter 1, verse 18, 1 Peter 1, verse 23. Now, notice um, the, the fact that this expression, born of God, John uses it seven times. He, he just loves the phrase, born of God. He re repetitively uses it. He brings it up over and over again. Uh, being born of God speaks of what? It speaks of spiritual birth from God. It, it speaks of a new relationship with the Lord that wasn't there before. New birth, second birth, being born again. It's uh, used this phrase, born of God, in chapter 3, verse 9, nine with reference to spiritual birth related to um, a lack of a relationship to sin. In chapter 4, verse 7, spiritual birth is logically related to expressing love. In chapter 5, verse 4, spiritual birth is logically related to overcoming the world. But notice here, in verse 1, how spiritual birth is logically related to faith in Jesus. It deals with exercising, saving, salvific faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1, just the very first part of that verse. It says, whoever believes... Not just knows about or has some information, but who believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. Historically, based on the first century, there were a group of individuals known as Corinthian Gnostics. And they had messed up in their mind who Jesus really is. They thought, um, well, he's simply a man, but he's not the Christ. And so they differentiated it between Jesus the man and the Christ spirit. And so they said, um, we recognize Jesus, but we cannot say that he, in fact, is Christ, that he is this unique person who the, the church claims is God's son. Now, many of you know this, but I'll just remind you, uh, that the word Christ, the English term, uh, comes from the Greek word Christos. Christos. And it simply means anointed one. Um, the Hebrew equivalent of Christ is Mashiach, or Messiah. And so, whether a person is referring to Messiah of the Hebrew Bible, or... Uh, the Christ of the New Testament, we're talking about the same individual. Many Jewish people around the world are looking forward to the Messiah coming the first time. We are looking forward to the Messiah coming the second time. But regardless of whether we're using the word Christos or Mashiach or Messiah, we're talking about this anointed one, this promised one, this one who has prophesied for centuries by the prophets. Now, of course, John does not limit the importance of our faith in Jesus to him only being the Christ. Uh, we're not Christians. We're not born again simply because we say, yep, Jesus is the Christ. I have my Christology, my belief in Jesus nailed down perfectly. No, it goes beyond that. He's also encouraging faith in the fact, in this epistle, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, chapter 4, verse 2, that he is God's Son, and that he is the Savior of the world, chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, in his commentary, critical and explanatory on the whole Bible, uh, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown say, Jesus could not reveal the way of salvation except he were a prophet. He could not work out that salvation except he were a priest. He could not confer that salvation upon us except he were a king. He could not be prophet, priest, and king except he were the Christ. That's good. And so this scholar is bringing out the threefold offices of Jesus as prophet, priest, and king all wrapped up in the Christ. 
Uh, notice again verse 1, the first part there, it says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. John is not merely promoting an intellectual assent to a body of knowledge. Like we would intellectually assent to the fact that there was a man by the name of George Washington uh, who evidently was our first president. Yes, I acknowledge that fact. No, he's, he's going beyond that. He's saying the belief that he's talking about is a trust. It's a dependency. It's a leaning on, a resting in. This is what he's driving at. There's a clinging to the person of Jesus, depending on him for eternal life and the abundant life in the here and now. This is a faith that includes an ethical dimension to it. It works its way out in our lives. It's not just something we keep to ourselves. It's not just an assent to a creed, some dogma, some body of information. Uh, the second half of verse 1 indicates that faith and love are inseparable. You see that there in chapter 3, verse 23? Now, let me throw this out to you. How does the Bible, not Jeff Kaplan, not any pastor, not any Bible teacher, how does the Bible identify a person who denies that Jesus is the Christ? How does the scripture describe a man, a woman, a child who rejects the claim that Jesus is the Messiah? That rejects the fact that he is the anointed one, the Christ. What does the Bible say about that person? Well, it is as though John takes off the gloves. He doesn't hold back anything. He's not pulling the, any punches. He, he says it like it is. In 1 John chapter 2, let me remind you, we went over this before. In verse 22, he says, who is, and here's a strong word he uses, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. That's a strong word. And so God's word itself says a person is not just fibbing or being a little deceptive, shading the truth, but that this person, in fact, is a liar to deny the messiahship of Jesus. It is as though God just gets right up in the face of a person, not holding back, and he has that strong word to say. And so we've looked at the first logical relationship, which is between our faith in Jesus and spiritual birth. Let's now zero in on a second logical relationship that John is bringing out in this passage. And it has to do with our love for the Father and our love for Christians. Have you sensed in your spirit within the last handful of years that there has been a lack of tolerance, not just for people who think differently from one another, but people even in the church who have a lack of tolerance, a lack of forbearance, a lack of even acceptance for people who don't look at everything just the way they do, biblically, politically, in so many different areas of life. And so the polarization, the lack of acceptance, the drawing the line in the sand between the haves and the have-nots, this is who we are, this is who you are, that chasm seems to have grown even within the church. There are times when I will be listening to individuals, pastors, content creators on social media, and there is almost this fighting spirit I pick up from some Bible teachers 
putting down pastors who don't go about ministry the way they think they should. And it's, it's, uh, it's divisive. It's, it's not a, a unifying thing within the body of Christ. It's not helpful. And Christians have separated themselves from other Christians on non-essentials. Not the fundamentals of the faith, but things that have no bearing on whether or not a person is a true child of God. And it's shameful. Could it be that the Apostle John was grappling with a lack of love that he sensed within the first century of believers? I, I can't be dogmatic about that, but I, I think it must be the case. Otherwise, why does he continually, you know, bang the drum about loving other believers? My, my sense is that not that John was just all about love, and us having a kumbaya fellowship experience with one another. But rather, there must have been some skirmishes, there must have been some animosities, there must have been some people who were at odds with one another, and they, they forgot the importance of simply loving their brothers and sisters in Jesus. Notice how John says in the second part of verse 1, whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. And so when we love God, we will love his kids. If we truly love the Lord God on high, then we don't just have an affection toward his people, we have a genuine love for them. Love for God and love for others are interrelated. If we have God as our Father and we love Him, then we will certainly also love His other kids. Even though our Wednesday night Bible study uh, does not draw many, there are times when we will be right in the middle of our study and I, I, I within my spirit, have a, a sense of appreciation and love for those who are there. And the thing that I love, in part, is I see God's fingerprints on their lives, just like I do with, with you as well. I know that you know and love the Lord, and I love seeing him in you. I'm drawn to you as I see him being working his way in your life as Christ-likeness is being formed. I love that about you. I love seeing my Jesus in Jesus people, in Jesus followers. And so there, there will be this automatic appreciation, this drawing to other believers because they remind us of Abba, of our daddy. That is such an important thing. John has previously drawn a connection between our love for God and our love for believers. Uh, you might recall from chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And so he says, Beloved, let us love one another. In chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, it says, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. And so in 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, what John is doing is he's recapitulating, he's repeating himself. He's saying the same idea again. Why? Because we don't get it. We don't get the importance of loving those within the family of God. We, we are shooting our wounded. And so a true believer will not only love God, that person will also love God's kids. Now, why does a person who loves God as his father also love believers? Why is that the case? Well, it's not just because other believers 
have money. We, we've spoken a lot about money today, and it's not like we're gravitating toward the ones who have money, and we love them. And if you're a pauper financially, we don't love you. <laughs> That's not the idea. Uh, and, and we don't uh, simply love you because you're more learned or because you come to church and you have a smile on your face or because, uh, like Dave Gilliam or John Brada, you've got the hug thing down. It's not just that we love you because you're affectionate. It, it goes deeper than that. We love God's children for another reason and simply because we love God's kids. We love his children. It's because the spiritual family relationship exists and we have a common father. We have the same Abba. And so if you want to show love to God, you must. This is not something that's optional. It's not an elective in school. You must show love to God's children. If you really love God, that will just flow out of your life. You're loving his people. Showing love to God's children is inseparable from loving God. The two go hand in hand. The two go together. God's children are his visible representatives on earth. And what is it in Matthew 25, verse 40? Jesus says, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. How you treat the people of God is how you treat Jesus himself. Allow that to be <clears throat> a brain tattoo in your thinking for a few moments. It does change things when we realize that. So maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, how do I know if I'm truly loving the way God wants me to love other believers? Well, there's the answer given to us in the first part of verse 2. Did you notice it? We've gone over this a few times, but let's see it again. He gives us a surprising answer, actually. He says, by this we gnosko. The, the Greek gives the idea of we know experientially. We don't just have cerebral, cognitive knowledge of this, but on an anecdotal, experiential basis, we know this. We've experienced this. How? That we love the children of God when we love God. Stop right there. Now, we would expect John to say just the opposite. We would expect John to say, uh, we know uh, that we demonstrate our love for God by loving God's children, but he doesn't say that. He's saying just the flip of that. He's saying that we know that we demonstrate our, our love for the children of God by loving God. So that takes us to a different place. That we know we're loving God's kids by loving God himself. Interesting. And so this shows that love is a central characteristic of a true believer. A love for the master. A genuine mark of a truly born again believer is love toward God and love toward other Christians. It goes both ways. One feeds into the other. The more you love God, the more you ought to be loving his people. The more you're loving his people, the more you're loving God. These are interconnected. Now, whether or not you love God's children can be de determined by the presence or the absence of your love for God's word and demonstrated by you putting in to practice the word of God. And so just as it's impossible to show love for God without loving his kids, so it is impossible to love God's children without loving God. That's his point. All right, let's, um, let's go to the third logical relationship. I, I, I know that um, a message like this uh, doesn't tickle us. I, I know that um, a, a talk like this um, is not full of word pictures and visuals. Uh, I, I'm aware that... Uh, that stories stick and facts fade. I, I'm aware of that. Uh, but as a communicator of the Word of God, my goal is to, to be as accurate above all else to the Scripture. And so the goal here is not to entertain. It, it's not fun and games. It's to be accurate and as clear in communicating the Word of God that it can possibly be. And 
we also are aware that we draw pictures in our own minds. Some of you are thinking about people in your life right now. Maybe they're professing Christians and you don't even like them, let alone want to love them. And you're thinking, how do I put this into practice? This is, this is difficult. But there is relevance to this. All right, I think you're ready for that third logical relationship. The first one was what? Our faith in Jesus involves being spiritually born of God. The second logical relationship is our love for the Father demonstrates itself in our love for Christians. Let's look at the third and final logical relationship, and that, that is our love for God and our obedience to God's word. The idea of showing love to our Lord by keeping his commandments is repeated often throughout the scripture. One of the greatest proofs, one of the greatest attestations, one of the greatest evidence of a true believer is an obedience to the word of God. Again, true believers are not just people who go around saying, I'm a Christian, I wear a cross, I give to various philanthropic organizations, I don't cuss, I don't swear, I don't watch X-rated movies, thereby, ergo, I'm a Christian. No. Um, Christians obviously grapple through those issues, but the bottom line for many of us in our understanding needs to be that a true Christian has an obedience to Scripture. Obeying the Master's word is of paramount importance. And Jesus uh, removes any ambiguity whatsoever in many statements he has made. Do you remember the time when Jesus was in the upper room and he's, he's having a little powwow with his disciples He's preparing his men for the fact that he is going to be leaving them. He's going to be laying down his life for their sins. He's going to be rising from the dead. He'll be entrusted to the hands of, of his uh, torturers. Well, in the context of preparing his men, he cements in their thinking how vitally important it is that as true believers, they obey Scripture. For example, in uh, John 14, 15, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's simple, to the point, right? In John 14, verse 21, he says over there, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. If you love me, this is what it looks like. You will keep my commandments. And then if they just didn't get it, he reinforces the same thought in John 14, uh, verses 23 and 24. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And then finally, in chapter 15, verse 10, he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, would you notice just the first part of verse 3 where it brings out this further development of the relationship of love for God and obedience to his word? Please don't miss this. That verse also refers to where there's no obedience to God, there is no love for God. Your proof of loving God simply comes down to obeying the book. I mean, we complicate it. But we don't need to be doing that. True believers love God to the extent that they put holy writ into practice. They don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk. Love for God and obedience to his word are inseparable. You see, when you are following the Lord, and you know when you are and when you're not, there ought to be a sense of joy in your spirit. There ought to be this sense of, yes, I follow the Lord. I actually successfully followed the Lord in this area in my life. And that feels good because that is your love letter back to God. You're saying, God, see, I love you. 
and I'm proving it, I'm demonstrating it by doing what you tell me to do. Notice the first part of verse 3. He says, for this is the love of or for God that we keep his commandments. I like how one scholar restates this idea. Love for God is real only when God's commands are kept. You know, when many people, maybe you, when you think about loving God, when you think about keeping his command, you think, oh, what a drag that is. I mean, I, it's hard to be a Christian. I, I, I don't feel like doing what the Bible tells me to do, especially today. I just, I need a little hiatus from the Lord. I need a respite. Just, just a break, you know. I, I, I go on a cruise or I head off to the coast when I'm, I'm on a break. I want to take a break from the book once in a while. It's hard. Sometimes we think these things to ourselves. We give ourselves the impression it's too hard to put God's word into practice. But John concludes verse 3 by assuring us that God's commandments are not what? I heard all of maybe two of you. Are not what? Burdensome. Yeah, burdensome. What is that? What does it mean? We don't, we don't use the word burdensome very often, do we? Uh, the Greek word is barei. It means weighty, heavy, hard, difficult. Pregnant women in their third trimester, especially when they're ready to give birth to their baby, they know what a burden is like. They're carrying around many, many pounds with them. They have their own, in a sense, personal bowling ball wherever they go. And they may try to sleep that night with great difficulty. It's difficult. Uh, they have their smart alecky husband that comes on the scene and they have to deal with him as well as the human bowling ball. And that's a, a burden, but it's not burdensome. It's not too difficult. It's difficult. It's hard. It's challenging. But it's not too hard. It's not too weighty. Because there's a finish line coming. There's a day when there'll be relief. It's a burden, but not burdensome. The word actually gives a sense of something that's oppressive. A scholar by the name of Hebert says, love of prompted obedience is not a crushing burden that exhausts the believer's strength and destroys his sense of freedom in Christ. He finds that the new life in Christ makes obedience possible and has implanted in him a desire to do the will of God, for he realizes that God has given his laws for the believer's own protection and highest welfare. He finds in them guidance concerning what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, in what sense are God's commandments not burdensome? How can we really say that? How do we really know that they're not burdensome? Well, I've given some thought to this, and there are a handful of reasons why we know carrying out God's command, God's word, is sometimes hard, but not too hard. It's difficult, not too difficult. It's challenging, it's not too challenging. And so if you're taking notes this morning, you might want to jot this down. One reason we know that God's commandments are not uh, too burdensome is because we have a new nature. And that nature gives us the power to obey God. The moment that you became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, God took away your, your heart of stone. He replaced it with the heart of flesh. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33 talks about this, this new covenant relationship with God. And he gives you this desire to want to, to do what God tells you to do. With this, this new spiritual nature, you were spiritually dead in the past, now you are spiritually alive to God. And so you have a power source based on this new relationship that you have. This is the implication of the word for at the beginning of verse 4. Notice it with me. 
God's commandments are not burdensome for, or we can swap out the word because, whatever is, here's the reason, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And so as a result, you want to please God. Because you're a new believer, you're a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17, you want to obey the Lord. Here's the second reason God's commandments are not too hard for you. They're not too burdensome. You can carry out the book, even though at times you feel like, God, I can't, it's too difficult. Well, a second reason you can pull this off, in other words, you can put into practice God's word, is because... Uh, his commandments, they come from a loving God. We have some, some young children in our church. Not a lot, but we have some. And once in a while, some of these young kids, um, with all their energy, they sometimes could put themselves in harm's way. I'm not hearing an amen here because you're all on your best behavior. I get it. You don't want parents to turn around and look at you and say, how dare you laugh at that comment from pastor. But hey, let's keep it real. Sometimes we have little kids. They could be behaving in ways that are a little dangerous. (laughs) I knew someone would come along, come around eventually. And um, so if if you tell, let's say, and I'm not thinking of any child. So please, let's not look at any one parent in particular here, or parents, whatever. Let's say there's a child that's just running around, just running around and comes this close to hitting his head or her head on the the sharp corner of that pulpit right there. And you as an adult say, stop, don't do that. You're going to hurt yourself. And you you could... forecast in your mind there is going to be some blood spilled really soon if this behavior doesn't change. But you have to be a little bit strong. You have to come across a little bit tough, a little harsh, and you say, stop! Well, that kid at that moment in time may feel, what a meanie. You're you're, you're so restrictive. Well, the child wouldn't say restrictive, but you get the idea. Um, Why won't you let me have fun? And, and, and play. And the child is not maybe mature enough to know that there has to be certain rules in place, certain standards of behavior for the child's best interest, for the child's welfare. And so what looks like a restrictive, oppressive, harsh form of control on the part of maybe a parent or a different adult is really an act of love. And so the same thing holds true when it comes to God's commands. He gives them to us, even though at times they feel restrictive, they feel maybe even controlling, because God, get this, as our manufacturer, knows what's best. He wired us together. He knows how we best work. And when we do what our manufacturer tells us to do, it's in our best interest. And so one reason why God's commandments are not burdensome is because they're for our good, our highest good from our loving God. There's a third reason why God's commandments are not burdensome, and that simply is because of their value. Um, Again, uh, we're kind of saying this in different words, but God's commandments... Um, are not given to bind us or give us pain. Uh, They're wise and good gifts from God to show us the way that we are to live. Uh, Fourth, and uh, we're almost done here, God's commandments are not burdensome because of our love for God. When you really love someone, you will put up with a lot. I said to Zanita this morning, I, 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 I was getting ready for the morning, I looked in the mirror and I thought, you look horrible. You you look old. Um, you're, 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 you don't look like you used to. Um, I, I can't even look at you anymore. I'm looking in the mirror and my hair is freaked out. I'm sure I smell. You were looking at my hair. 
And uh, I, I said to Zane, I said, um, do, I, do I look old to you? And she said, you better believe it. No, no. <laughs> you know as well as I do, Zanita doesn't talk that way. She says, no, honey, you do not look old to me. <laughs> well, there's a, an old uh, proverb, uh, love feels no load. So even though she's really at times looking at an old guy, a disgusting looking guy at times, a guy who doesn't smell great at times, she still loves me. And she's, she's willing to put up with, to bear with whatever challenges that I bring into her life. Os Oswald Chambers, I like how he, he puts this. Um, and before I read this, uh, if we really love God, we will want to please him. We'll want to obey him. It, it's not a burden. You follow God's word out of your love for him. Again, Oswald Chambers says, if my relationship to him is that of love, I will do what he says. If I hesitate, it is because I love someone I have placed in competition with him, namely myself. Whew. You thought we were going to say someone else. No, it's because of we love this guy more than that guy. Or you can say that about you. You love yourself more than him. That's the competition. You say, but Jeff, uh, again, I, I'm just thinking through because I'm one of these uh, yeah, but people. Aren't there times when um, it, it, it seems like God's commandments are burdensome, that they are a challenging? Aren't there certain exceptions to this? Yeah, actually, believe it or not, there are. God's commandments are a burden to you. They are too difficult for you when your desire overrides your desire to carry out the word of God. When your spirit is committed to carry out your fleshly activity, to sin in a certain area, you are bound and committed to move in that direction. At that time, the idea of carrying out God's word, it, it's a burden. You, you don't want to do it. Your, your headspace is just not there. Uh, Pastor Timothy Peck, uh, with Glenn Kirk Church, has a good word. He says, disobedience to God's commands is a far more crushing weight than obedience is. Christians often talk about the cost of discipleship, how following Jesus Christ does indeed cost us, but people rarely talk about the cost of non-discipleship that a Christian who chooses a path of disobedience to God chooses a much more painful and difficult path because the weight of disobedience is a crushing weight. Dallas Willard writes, to depart from righteousness is to choose a life of crushing burdens, failures, and disappointments, a life caught in the toils of endless problems that are never really solved. Yeah, yeah. Disobedience to God's commands is a crushing weight. It is hard on a believer when that believer is entertaining sin because you are conflicted. The new nature is fighting against the flesh. And so there's this battle. Well, as we wrap this up, I just want to make a, a couple of point, points here. If you are failing to keep God's commandments in your life personally, could it be that you need to know the commander himself? If you don't know the author of this book, this book becomes like a bowling ball, a heavy weight, a burden that you cannot carry out on your own. The commandments of God are not a burden. They can be carried out, but we've got to know the commander. We've got to know the commander chief himself, the Lord God. Another word for commander we can swap out is the word Lord. Kurios in the Greek, it means master, ruler, owner. <clears throat> 
Well, this commander doesn't say, look, I want you to know that I'm like a drill sergeant and I'm going to whip you in shape. That's not what the commander I'm talking about says to people who don't know him. It is as though he takes his hand and he gestures. And he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my load is light. It's not burdensome. Jesus, in part, came to take off your spiritual burdens and replace those burdens with rest. Spiritual rest, which comes about as you exercise faith in him. Not faith plus your works, or faith plus your religious activity, or faith plus your your philanthropic behavior, faith alone in Jesus alone, which is the grace of God in your life. If you've never come to this commander, this wonderful, precious Savior, who I love with all my heart, and I have dedicated my life to him, I point you to him today. Come to Christ. He says, come. Come on now. I know you're, you're stalling a little bit. You're equivocating in your mind. Just come. Come exactly as you are. You may not have everything figured out in terms of understanding all the ins and outs of a relationship with Jesus. He did all the work. You simply come to him in faith. Receive him as your Savior and as your Lord.